the I wanted to go into a little bit on the historical information with the word enthugen and how and why it came about. Uh, basically around 1978, uh, Gordon Wass and Carl A.P. Ruck from Boston University and Jonathan Ott got together with uh, Jeremy Bigwood and they <clears throat> there was a frustration at the time with the use of the word obviously hallucinogen because many of the visions that people see on those things, they absolutely deny that there are any type of hallucination. Uh, the, problem with, the problem with the word psychedelic, and it's actually psychodelic, it's a, the, the, in the, 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 the word psychedelic is a misappropriation of the Greek language, but uh, because of the 1960s and the psychedelic movement, the word psychedelic had become a, a dirty word with too many heavy connotations on it relating to the uh, 60s and early 70s drug culture. And so Carl Ruck, who is a professor of Greek classics at Boston University, coined the term entheogen. And what's interesting about the word entheogen, uh, as opposed to psychedelic, the word psychedelic means to manifest the mind or to bring forth the mind. And actually it's a if it, it, if it didn't have the stigma behind it, it would be a fantastic word to use because you know, the word entheogen, psychedelics are not always used as entheogens. And as Professor Tom Roberts from Chicago University is a professor emeritus up there that teaches the only still running class on psychedelics that's listed in the, uh, in the uh, annual uh, class listings every year is that we have what is the entheogenic use of psychedelics. And when, we, you know, like if we're doing something like uh, prof uh, uh, Professor Roland Griffiths out at Johns Hopkins University that did the study on, on psilocybin mushrooms uh, and proving the religious experience with those, that's an entheogen. If we're using them for, say, post-traumatic stress disorder or something that, like that, that's not always necessarily an entheogen. And Tom Roberts has brought a lot uh, uh, light to try and separate that because psychotomimic and, and a lot of these different words ha uh, fail us. And, but interestingly, uh, Dr. Steve Baer's new book, Singing to the Plants, argues that ayahuasca is, in fact, a hallucinogen opposed to mushrooms and things that, like that that are arguably not hallucinogens. And then <clears throat> the ironic part behind all of this is that Carl Ruck, who coined the term, he's actually an atheist. And the word entheogen was never meant to, and a lot of people have a lot of trouble with the word entheogen, and I hear it all the time because they say, oh, well, I don't want to belong to any Christian connotation of, of God, but that's not what, what the word was coined for. It's about generating your God within you. It's not about any dogmatic religious God, you know, some white beard sitting on the throne somewhere. It's about discovering your own divinity. And uh, so anyway, that's what I wanted to go into on the word entheogen. Well, I feel like we've got a variety of perspectives on that uh, question for which there are so many answers. Um, I'd like to move on uh, and talk a little bit about spores. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about just what exactly is a spore? Why are they so special? <clears throat> okay, what is a spore? So of all the organic things we've ever studied, it's the closest thing that's organically available that's a metal. And um, it's one of the few things that's alive that can actually survive its own space re-entry into the atmosphere. So what a spore is, is it's a very, very complicated program on a very, very small piece of... Um, let's call it memory. So there's a very complicated program on this little piece of memory, and it's almost a metal, and what it's designed to do is actually create a nervous system in an environment. So when it gets in an environment, and it gets in some water, it actually unfolds itself, and the mycelium starts to happen. And mycelium is the Supposedly, I've heard from um, Terence McKenna, the oldest conscious living entity in the galaxy. 
And so the mycelium actually, what it does is it creates little crystals and these crystals go out into the environment and they discover whatever is around the spore in the environment, whatever chemicals are around it. And the crystals come back to the spore and then the mycelium manufactures whatever will chemically break down what is immediately surrounding it. And it keeps doing that. It moves progressively out into the environment. And what it does is it creates a neural network between anything that's alive in the environment that it encounters. So this stuff shows up first before any other types of life are developed and creates sort of like, um, you know, the, the network of, of information flow that allows life to unfold. It's so, so it's like kind of like the operating system for a environment. Like Paul Stamens talks about how if we go into an environment where we've totally destroyed everything about that environment and we start the mycelium back up again, it basically ushers in every other type of life form back into that environment. That was amazing, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the ride. I, I just want to um, add to that, which is something that I completely did not think about until you started talking, but in the 80s, in the like 1984, I think, I went to Esalen and I spent three days with Terence McKenna. And I had never done, I knew nothing about psychedelics. I had no idea really what I was doing there. Uh, except that a, a doctor a friend of mine, you know, offered to pay and take me to Esalen. So <laughs> I went, and that was kind of the beginning of the journey. But I do remember Terrence McKenna talking about how he felt that um, mushrooms were an, the closest thing to something that is, or not the closest thing, but is it is self-perpetuating. It lives off its own death. It grows on feces. And um, that's, you know, how it regenerates. And that uh, he had this theory that it was an alien species, that it was actually like an interdimensional thing that was here on this planet connected, you know, connecting us interdimensionally. I just thought I'd throw that in. You know, in the, um, in the Lutgawa Tacoma tradition that I spent time in, and then spending time down in Mexico with Zapotec people. Um, it's interesting that mushrooms are always taken in pairs traditionally. Um, the psilocybin, cyanescence, and the psilocybin, psilocybin. And, um, you know, in ceremonies down in Mexico, they're referred to as los niñitos, the, the children. This divineness, this sacredness makes, you know, as it's communicating through this whole network, and it's and it and it creates these little fruiting bodies to say, "Hey, come discover your world." Like, you know, I'm in communication with all of it. I don't know how many of you have, are familiar with Jan's work, but he made an incredible documentary about the historical role of mushrooms and the mushroom religions and cults. And uh, do you want to talk about that for us for a minute? Because I would love to hear you talk about that. <laughs> Well, I figured somebody would call me out eventually. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, um, this is really the foundation of where the religions came from. And going back to the, the book that, we, that I published, the first primary text, the first solid evidence of mushrooms and religion, uh, Professor Carl Ruck, who I mentioned a minute ago, when I was at his house in uh, April of 2008, he handed me this postcard of an image from this chapel from, Mont, uh, from Montfer Montferrand du Perigord, France, which is the image on the front cover of the book here. And that is a painting inside a 12th century chapel actually depicting Jesus as the mushroom riding on the back of St. Christopher. 